um, to order Mount Pleasant Public School Board of Education a regular meeting on March 15, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. held by Zoom or on Zoom. The meeting of the Mount Pleasant Public School Board of Education is a meeting conducted in public but is not a meeting of the public. There is a time for public participation during the meeting is indicated in the agenda. The purpose of today's meeting is to conduct regular business that requires action by the board. These items may include those discussed at a previous meeting or presented to the board for discussion this evening. Let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Next, I'd like to read the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement Statement. The Mount Pleasant Public Schools would like to acknowledge that we are here on the beautiful ancestral land of the Anish Anishinaabe people and the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe, who continue to be our neighbors and partners. In the proud spirit of collaboration and celebration in both languages, we say boozoo and welcome. All right, um, Courtney, if you can do roll call. Dana Calkins. Huh? Jessica Jernigan. Here. Mommy. Sheila Murphy. Here. Mommy. Tim Odekirk. Here. William Pengel. Here. Courtney Stegman. Here. Amy Bond. Here. Next is the approval of the agenda. Is there any concerns or changes? Not seeing any. Next is the Student Board of Education representative report from Lauren Roof. Hello everyone. So right now we are in the process of voting for next year's uh, Student Senate. We also are moving forward with um, continuing our homecoming uh, plans. So we're planning to decorate the halls and have our reverse parade, which is where all of our clubs and groups and homecoming court from the fall are gonna set up around the block. And the community and all of our school members can now, like, they can go around the block um, and see everybody, which should be fun. And then our Oscars this year is going to be virtually, and the new eboard will plan an eighth grade exchange video instead of an eighth grade, an actual eighth grade exchange, which we did this this year. And then we also are planning the farewell tour for our seniors to be as safe as possible. And we also are having an ice cream social for our seniors this year. And also, um, our third hour business management class is creating an Euler calendar, which, is have, which has um, pictures of all of our clubs and sports teams and everything. And um, it also includes uh, everybody's birthday in the school, which should be fun. And then, um, so these calendars will be going on sale soon. So I'll be sure to mention something like that at our next meeting. So that is all. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, next is the superintendent report. Good evening, everyone. I just had um, two really um, fast celebrations that I wanted to be able to share with you as board members, but also with our community, because I think uh, we spend a lot of time right now focused on some of our challenges. So uh, first and foremost, I wanted to um, join uh, Matt Tayton in our fine arts department in recognizing Aaron Wang. Aaron is an eighth grader this year and he competed in the 2021 Music Teachers National Association Music Competition. Um, and I'm just gonna read to you a little bit about the competition. Um, the MTNA national competitions are the most successful and prestigious student competitions in the country each year. Thousands of students compete for top prizes and national recognition. The purpose of the Music Teachers National Association performance Competition is to provide educational experience for students and teachers to recognize exceptionally talented young artists and their teachers in their pursuit of musical excellence. The three tier junior, senior, and young artist performance competitions begin at the state level, and then each division of the state level rises to the next level where winners compete at the national finals. Aaron finished first place in the junior division at the state level and advanced to the national finals. At the national level, Aaron placed fourth overall, which is outstanding. So we recognize Aaron as, a, as someone that's really made a major accomplishment 
an achievement and we wanted to be able to take a moment at our board meeting to celebrate him this evening. Um, the second piece that I wanted to be able to celebrate, which I just think is a really great story, is a success from our McGuire Student Council. And uh, Erin King just happens to be on this evening. I don't even know if she realizes that uh, we wanted to acknowledge this, but some of you may have, have noticed that our student council at McGuire um, sold candy grams, which is a common fundraiser that student councils do, especially around holidays. So I believe this was around Valentine's Day. And their um, student council was able to raise four, $544 that they donated um, to the Carter Moody Scholarship at CMU and the College of Education. And um, after the donation, President Davies was so impressed by the efforts of our McGuire Student Council that he personally matched their donation. So in total, they were able to donate $1,088 to the Carter Moody Scholarship Fund. So Aaron, kudos to you and to your McGuire staff and student council representatives. What a, what a great thing uh, to, to do to support our community. So thank you very much. So that's all I wanted to report on this evening, although I'll be back when we start to talk about return to school. Thanks, Jen. Those are wonderful things. Um, all right, next is the requested financial report. Ginger. Yes, good evening. I have for you tonight the financial reports for general fund and special services funds for the revenue and expenditure comparing um, budget to actual for the month ending February 2020 compared to February 2021. For general fund, revenue is currently at 51% of budget this year compared to 48% last year, and expenditures are at 53% both years. For the special service funds, athletics, revenue is at 0% this year compared to 11% last year, and expenditures is at a negative 8% this year compared to 26% last year. Remember, this is a self-sustaining sport. So this is a hockey program and that negative expenditure is from a um, reimbursement from PCMI of an overpayment from prior year. So that will all be made up with the hockey program at the end of the year. The Children's Learning Center revenue is at 73% of budget this year compared to 77% last year. And expenditures are at 55% of budget this year compared to 60% last year. For the nurse testing program, there's no revenue. There will no longer be revenue in this program. We're just spending down fund balance. Um, and expenditures are currently at 1% of budget compared to 5% last year. For the food service fund, revenue is at 37% of budget compared to 54% last year, and expenditures are at 36% of budget compared to 49% last year. And for our school store, revenue is at 25% of budget this year compared to 92% last year, and expenditures are at 29% of budget compared to 75% last year. For the treasurer's report, general fund on January 31st had a cash balance of $3.3 million. In the month of February, we had income in the amount of almost $6.5 million and disbursements of $3 million. That brings us a balance on February 28th of six point, close to $6.8 million. For the debt retirement fund on January 31st, we had a cash balance of $2.5 million. We had receipts in the amount of $1.1 million in a small disbursement of $219. That brings us a balance on February 28th of $3.6 million. And for the Capital Projects Fund, on January 31st, we had $2.8 million. We had a small amount of interest income, $92, and no disbursements for the month of February. That brings us a balance on February 28th of $2.8 million. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we did not have any correspondence. Um, next is the consent items. So um, for the consent items, the first is the approval of the minutes for the March 1st, 2021 regular meeting. So moved. Second. So Tim called, Wheeling seconded. Um, Courtney, if you can do that. Yes, Kadernigan? Uh, yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Tim Odekirk? Yes. William Pengel? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. No. Unanimously passed. Um, 
Next is the approval of the bills in the sum of $3,030,533.11. And so moved. A second. Sheila and then Tim. Courtney, if you can do roll call. Jessica Jernigan? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Tim Odekirk? Yes. Willeen Pengel? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. And that's a unanimous pass for that. Thank you. Um, next is new business. Uh, starting with retirement. Good evening, everyone. We would like the board to honor the retirement of Mr. Steve Hoyle. Mr. S Mr. Hoyle has been with us since 1994. Um, that means he's been with the district for 27 years. Um, he's going to finish out the year um, at the high school and wrapping up JV Boys Baseball as well. Thank you, Mr. Hoyle. I move we accept the retirement of Mr. Hoyle and thank him for his many years of service in academics and athletics and in community. Seconded. That's Tim and then Jessica. Courtney Rolka. Jessica Jernigan. Yes. Sheila Murphy. Yes. Tim Odekirk. Yes. William Pengel. Yes. Courtney Stegman. Yes. Amy Bond. Yes. And thank you very much. That is a, a long career. Next is new hire. Yes, um, next we are happy to welcome Emily Richards. Um, many of the board members remember working um, closely with Lori Richards over the years. She was a teacher in our district for a long time. Um, she taught my own little girl. And then uh, Emily Richards is a Euler graduate. And uh, she was interviewed, I think last week by Stephanie House, myself and um, Kelly Maryhugh. And it was so refreshing. It was one of those where we got off the interview and we were just like, oh, we need to hire this girl. And I don't, I don't even know if we waited um, 24 hours to, to email Emily and welcome her home to be a part of her uh, Euler family again. So we would be very excited if the board would approve um, Emily. She is certified in special education and she also has a major in mathematics and she's going to be um, extremely well utilized the moment we can get our hands on her um, as an MSU grad. There are motion to hire Emily Richards. So moved. Second. Second that. And Emily, thank you for being on tonight. Yes. Congrats, Emily. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica Jernigan. Yes. Jernigan. Sheila Murphy. Yes. Tim Odekirk. Yes. William Pengel. Yes. Courtney Stegman. Yes. Amy Bond. Yes. And welcome. We're so excited to have you. All right. Next is donation. We have a donation this evening that we're asking you to accept from Isabella Community Credit Union. It's a $500 donation that'll be used for our Students of Promise. Our Students of Promise is a program that supports our homeless students with their needs across the district. So. We're asking that you approve that donation this evening. A motion to accept the donation for students of promise. So moved. Seconded. I think that was Wheeling and then Sheila, is that correct? Okay. All right, Courtney, roll call. Jessica Jernigan. Yeah. Yes. Sheila Murphy. Yes. Tim Odekirk. Yes. William Pengel. Yes. Courtney Segman. Yes. Amy Bond. Yes. He's his own secretary here. I was going to say, I love it. His voice is perfect. Uh, the unanimous pass. Thank you very much. Um, next is the Mid Michigan College Annexation Proposal Resolution. Yeah. After our um, board meeting on March 1st, um, I was contacted by a couple of different board members um, wanting to know how we can move forward and express our formal support of the Mid-Michigan College annexation. So 
I will turn things over for Jessica, who did a lot of work on this resolution. Sure, and thank you for your help so much, Jennifer. Um, uh, we all saw Scott Mertz's presentation at our last meeting. Um, I think we all know that Mount Pleasant um, supported this initiative in uh, November. We get a chance to vote on it again. Um, and I just reached out to Scott to see if there was anything we could do to help. He suggested an endorsement would be helpful. Um, so that's why I brought that uh, forward today. Um, I, we all saw the same presentation. We all have had opportunities to do our own research. I have my notes from our last meeting and from research I've done since then. So if you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Jessica, I, I appreciate you taking the effort to build this um, resolution. It's a great thing for our community and I think it's great for our board to move forward on. Thank you, Tim. Jessica, would you like to read the annexation? Or I'm sorry, would you like to read that, what you wrote? I don't actually have it in front of me right now, as okay. a matter of fact. <laughs> I, I would be happy to read it if, if you want okay. me to, just so that the public Thank is you. aware. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yep, sure. So it's Mount Pleasant Public Schools Board of Education statement supporting the annexation of Mount Pleasant Public Schools to the in-district service area of Mid Michigan College. Whereas the community of Mount Pleasant will have the opportunity to vote on two proposals regarding the annexation of Mount Pleasant Public Schools territory to Mid Michigan College's in-service in area on May 4th, 2021. Whereas Mount Pleasant Public Schools values our existing partnership with Mid Michigan College, whereas Mount Pleasant Public Schools recognizes the importance of post secondary education in the lives of our community members, whereas Mount Pleasant Public Schools appreciates the financial savings to members of the Mount Pleasant community who enroll at Mid Michigan College if our school district is annexed, whereas Mount Pleasant Public Schools understands the benefits of this annexation for area businesses seeking well-educated, highly skilled employees. Therefore, be it resolved, the Mount Pleasant Public Schools Board of Education endorses both the annexation proposal and the millage proposal that will make the Mount Pleasant Public Schools District part of MidMichigan service area. Thank you, Jen, for reading that. And Jessica, thank you so much for putting that together. Is there a motion to pass um, the annexation as um, written or is the board supporting the annexation? So moved. I will second. We lean and then Tim. Uh, Courtney, roll call vote. Lola? No. Jessica Jernigan. Yes. No. Sheila Murphy. No. Yes. Tim Odekirk. Yes. William Pengel? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. That's a unanimous pass for that. Um, next is the NEOLA policy, 854005. Yeah, say this one five times fast. This is our emergency temporary telecommuting, telecommuting, telecommuting policy. And this um, recognizes our attempts to um, let employees work from home whenever possible um, and that is approved by the superintendent however not all positions can be completed from home so we have to take that into consideration but if the job assignment allows it we um, we have been and will continue to um, honor that through the, with this policy um, throughout COVID and as I mentioned it is considered a temporary policy. Is there a motion to pass the NEOLA policy? So moved. Second. Jessica, and then we lean. Uh, Courtney, roll call. Jessica Jernigan? Yes. Hi. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Tim Odekirk? Yes. William Pengel? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. And that unanimously passes. Next, um, Jen, it's the extended COVID learning plan. Yeah, so this evening uh, we have a variety of different staff members that are joining us to help us present on different areas regarding our return to school plan. We're really gonna focus on three main areas this evening. 
One is our enrollment and give you an update of where things ended up for third trimester. Um, the second area is looking at what's happening on virtual Wednesdays at Mount Pleasant Middle School and Mount Pleasant High School. And then the third area is an update on our air quality and how those, those readings look. So um, hopefully we can target some information. And we determine those three areas based on the feedback we've received um, since we talked about the return to school plan back in February. So let me um, work on sharing my screen here quickly. which this is often an area where I struggle, so I apologize. Okay, and there, so everyone can see that? Okay, so uh, first to begin with, I just wanna um, highlight some general information, um, trying to again focus on the positive aspects um, of the pandemic. Um, as of today, just over 67% of the Mount Pleasant Public School staff has received both doses of the COVID vaccine. Uh, we're, we're very happy with that number. I do believe that will continue to increase over time as individuals are still able to schedule their own appointments uh, with the Central Michigan District Health Department. They are no longer holding um, large clinics for teachers, but they have individual appointments that are available for them. Uh, we also need to remember that uh, the organizations that we contract with like Grand Rapids Building Services, SFE, uh, the City of Mount Pleasant for Peak, and um, Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe, all of those agencies, uh, ESS, who is our sub service, all those agencies, their employees were also able to get the vaccine, although those numbers aren't included here in our numbers. Um, I, I really feel very strongly and very positively about our collaboration across our county and across our region. Um, I will be able to share later this week information regarding two pop-up testing clinics that will be hosted at Mount Pleasant High School. Uh, those clinics will be hosted on April 4th and April 7th, with the idea being as families return to our community after spring break, we wanna make sure that we have a convenient option for testing for them. This is being coordinated um, with Mount Pleasant Public Schools, Crash at Isabella RESD, the City of Mount Pleasant, and the lead role, the, the organization taking the lead role on this is the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So basically we provide the location, they'll bring everything in to provide this service to our community. And this is for all community members. So our employees, our students, their families, CMU students. Um, it's my understanding that April 7th is one of CMU's wellness days. So that might be a day where students and faculty members might have some additional free time. So we're really excited about that collaboration and to be able to offer that service to our community. Um, finally, I think we maintain a strong focus on our safety protocols and on the mental health of our staff and students. That's been our consistent focus all the way through. Um, and I'm proud that we've been able to continue that. Looking at our current numbers, um, I've tried to do this since November, just to put it in perspective, so you know where we stand. Um, unfortunately, I, I do believe that we are seeing a slight increase in our area. And from what I'm hearing, this is not unique to the Mount Pleasant Public Schools. This is across the board, um, not only in the region of the Central Michigan District Health Department, but in all the regions that Dr. Morris supervises. Um, so while it's an increase, it certainly is not back to the large spike that we saw in numbers um, in November, but we do see a slight increase with our active cases and especially with our active students in quarantine right now. So again, we started our third trimester last week. This runs through uh, June 4th. Our safety is still a top priority as I stated earlier. We're still following the COVID protocols that we established back in August. Masks are required at all times for all grade levels. Classrooms are dis disinfected every four hours or after a class transition. Buildings are deep cleaned on a rotational schedule and our bus protocols remain the same. I think a key factor in keeping our students safe continues to be our partnership with our families so that we can trust that our families are screening students every morning before they leave for school. As you know, as required at this meeting that we review our two-way communication numbers for the last four weeks. Uh, this is a requirement of the return to learn legislation. 
um, that it has the three basic parts, our goals, our progress reports, and our monthly reconfirmation meetings. So we're looking at data from PowerSchool from the previous four weeks. And we know that our teachers have until Wednesday of the next week to share this in or to input this information into PowerSchool. So there is a little bit of a lag. You can see the format for the report. I'll update it slightly after this evening's meeting. Um, I have added in um, information regarding the high school's change for third trimester. It's starting on March 9th, all of Mount Pleasant High School students who want to will have the option to attend face-to-face -face four days a week. So looking at the two-way interaction rates for all grade levels, first we'll start with developmental kindergarten to second grade. We have a rate for all students. We have a rate for our students that are 100% remote, which that's the Oilers Online program. And then our students that are not 100% remote, that will be our face-to-face. -face. So you can see at our DK2 level and actually at all levels, our teachers have really been knocking it out of the park, reaching out to students um, and making sure that they're making those connections. Third through fifth grade again. The rate for this last week for the third through fifth grade is a little bit lower than we would like it to be, but I imagine if we check it again in a week, it will be up uh, in the neighborhood of the high 90s again. Sixth through eighth grade, um, again, doing an excellent job of reaching those students. Those students that are 100% remote are the hardest students for us to reach. And so we've gotten really creative um, in the ways that we, we've been able to reach them. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. And then our ninth through 12th grade, then you can see obviously there's a lot of record keeping that needs to be added in uh, for this last week here. So we'll make sure that we do that and we'll provide you an update. Typically, uh, when we've looked at this, this schedule, the, the fourth week for Mount Pleasant High School has been in the range of the high 50s to mid 60s. So I'm thinking that just with the transition to trimesters, with more students coming back face to face, it's just a record keeping issue that needs to be cleaned up. I'll go back to our PowerPoint. Now we're going to look at those areas that I mentioned earlier, where first we're going to start by looking at our enrollment update, and I will turn it over to Erin King to talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Erin. Hi hey everyone, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about what our enrollment numbers look like for this third trimester. All of us welcomed back quite a few students for trimester three, so they had another first day of school yet again, and we feel like we've had quite a few of those first days of school this year, um, which is not traditional. So we welcomed more students face-to-face -face than we had in the past. If you look at the Oilers Online column, that is not broken down in each grade level as it was in the past, it's broken down by school. Um, so our Oilers Online classrooms in general, the number has went down and they are able to run small groups differently than they were in the past with a much lower number and able to provide differentiated instruction. Our range um, with students in the classrooms, we're trying to stick to that um, four to six feet. We do have some classrooms that are three and that's the absolute um, you know, minimum, but we are trying to really stick to um, higher space between students. And if we do have classrooms that are three, we're really trying to make sure that we're sticking to those protocols that we know work, making sure to use hand sanitizer, masks are on, um, being aware of social distancing whenever possible, and trying to make sure that we're staying diligent with the protocols that are set in place to protect us all. Um, we, if you look at that last column for missing students, we have um, a list there for you that kind of shows those students that we haven't been able to connect with as well and that we're more concerned about. And we're utilizing a variety of strategies to help us contact them, such as um, emails and even scrolling through who's on their power school list as emergency contacts and trying to contact someone there and say, hey, you know, we haven't heard from this student. Could you let their, their mom or their dad know or their guardian so that we're able to connect with them? Um, emailing, not just calling, um, reaching out through Google Classroom. When we see the student on Go Guardian, maybe, on something that is not Google Classroom, trying to um, activate the chat with them that way to connect with them. We're even doing um, well visits with, through the liaison officer, trying to make sure we're making those connections with students, as well as reaching out to our truancy officer, Joelle Snyder, to try to make sure we're really connecting with those families. Because even though that number is there, there are students and we just are very concerned about them just as we would be if they're face to face. 
Thank you. Thank you, Erin. We'll go on to talk more about what's happening on our virtual days at Mount Pleasant Middle School, Mount Pleasant High School. And Darby Weaver is here with us this evening with a team of teachers. So Darby, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce who you have with you. Hello, I have um, Dan Weber and Nicole Hagel with me, um, two middle school teachers. And then also we had a team of um, about three or four other teachers that helped us put the presentation together today. So. Um, Mr. Weber and Ms. Hagel are here to answer any questions specifically that you have for them. And I'm gonna present the information, but they are here for backup and to help. So the first thing that the team wanted to share with you tonight was just kind of a simple example of our cohort model daily schedule and a traditional day schedule if we were in um, non-COVID times. Uh, we hear a lot about the middle school uh, students kind of only being here for half day and uh, when you look at the actual times our students are receiving uh, that still all five periods in the morning of their core instruction and one elective for certain grades but if you kind of look at the times it really lines up uh, that our students are receiving um, quite a bit of instruction and our teachers are here for full time along with like their lunch and their prep so we wanted to just kind of line that up just so that everyone understands that our students are still receiving the same amount of instructional time and our teachers are still here for the same amount of time um, as a normal traditional day. So uh, um, this year teachers are receiving a prep and lunch and teaching online during team prep. That's one change that we made this year. We don't have team prep, but we're doing our Oilers online at that time. And we also have 11 teachers who are also teaching online during their normal prep or having some additional online students that are in addition to their team prep time. So we have quite a few teachers who are teaching even more than just the normal load for, te for team prep. Um, the other thing they wanted to point out was teachers teach straight face-to-face -face first through fifth hour. None of our teachers have any prep or um, break at all for the cohort model. We teach st straight from 735 until 1157. So, um, and remember with the cohort model, they're being escorted from class to class and we're cleaning in between. So quite a busy time for all of us from 7.35 until about noon. So uh, just to remember, remind everyone that, you know, not really looking at half day, we hear that quite a bit. We're here full day, we're working pretty hard, even extra for our Oilers online. So a couple of clarifications, what are the teacher expectations on virtual Wednesdays and the students' expectations? Uh, teachers are expected to provide instruction for both the online and the face-to-face -face students. Their instruction is really based on where they're at with their pacing or their scope and sequence, but they have to provide either a live lesson, a pre-recorded lesson, or an assignment with instructions posted. And the live instruction must follow the live schedule, which you can see over there on the bottom right. And that live instruction schedule has been uh, the schedule that has been followed since second trimester. And it's the same schedule that's followed when we went all virtual as well. We have WAGs or week at a glance and uh, the teachers need to re uh, make sure they're communicating in their WAGs which type of instruction they have and any office hours they may have or um, Google Meets or kind of help time that they have for the students as well. And during virtual Wednesdays, our teachers have been able to receive an additional 12 hours of professional development when the year is over on um, how to better their remote learning. Students' expectations. Students have to log into each of their Google Classrooms and complete the attendance forms, and they need to follow the instructions from their teacher for that day's work located in the Google Classroom. And they need to follow their live schedule, which is the same schedule that's below there on, the, on that slide. So on the next slide, you can see that we communicate every single week with our families on um, three different ways of how our students can see and our teachers are presenting or communicating what they need to do on virtual Wednesday. So every Sunday night, our parent WAG is sent out after six o'clock. And that parent WAG, if you can see, it has the team WAG part there. Every team has a separate team, week at a glance. And the bottom where the virtual schedule is, that has actually been posted on our parent WAG since second trimester started that same exact picture, just keeps getting repeated. Once you click your team WAG, you're then in the middle column 
and that's an example of a teacher's WAG that explains there in purple um, any live times or where they can do any help time or a, a specific kind of one-on-one -on -one Google Meet. And then on the bottom part with the team WAG, same thing, they, they communicate how they're going to learn during the Wednesday time. And then once they go into the Google Classroom on the right, it'll explain exactly expectations for today, the assignment, um, that's two different Google Classrooms there on the right that you can see two different ways that it's communicated. So um, we communicate this every single Sunday then after six o'clock, you can see what needs to be done every single day with our students, but Wednesdays especially with the lives. The next slide. Um, this slide we've, you have seen before, I added a few things, but these are additional things that our teachers use Virtual Wednesday for. Uh, the biggest, again, is communicating with the online students and families. And as you can see, um, our two-way communication numbers are there. And we are, um, the staff is working really hard to make sure they're communicating with, with all of their students. Um, we've had to recreate all of our assignments. So everything, we just have to remember this year that everything to be put online was recreated. Nothing was something that we already did and just reposted. So. That's something that's spent quite a bit of time for creating uh, assignments, assessments, feedback, all the instruction for online, for the Oilers online students for all week, and for all of the students for virtual Wednesdays. Professional development topics are there on the bottom as well, which are the same as what I've shared before. And the last, or the next slide. Uh, same thing, reminders. We're able to connect with the face-to-face -face and Oilers Online students on virtual Wednesdays, so we're able to put both of those classes together uh, so that some of our online students are able to communicate with the face-to-face -face students virtually. Same thing, teachers have had to recreate everything. Um, we've communicated with students. Oh, uh, just a reminder, I think that if there are um, concerns or questions or something that we're missing is just making sure communicating with the students' teachers um, if there's any need specifically, because those WEGs really explain everything, but if there's ever a specific need, all of the teachers are really willing to help with anything. Um, again, teachers are providing instruction for Oilers Online and face-to-face, -face, and that's something we needed to do as we continued having Oilers Online. Um, ability of teachers differ and growth has been amazing. We're still following those CDC guidelines. And uh, we are very close to everyone still being six feet apart. So our social distancing is there. So with our class size numbers, we might only have three hours at the most that would be less than six feet. So I think we've done a nice job with being able to do that with our cohort model. And then I just added three different or four different pieces there on parent and student input that we have received about virtual Wednesdays and actually positive notes and emails about how they have seen those Euler Online students benefit from Virtual Wednesdays and um, even some of the students appreciating having, having some of that, especially the Oilers Online. And then the last slide is just um, the teachers wanted you to know that we welcome anyone in to come and visit us and be able to see how our cohort model is working and how our Virtual Wednesdays work and can always shadow any staff member or spend any time asking any questions of them as well. So we had Dan Weber, Nicole Hagel, Rachel Jackson, Craig Serbrook, and Sarah Muscat help with this presentation. And they are here, Dan and Nicole are, to answer any questions that you might have when the question time comes up. Excellent, thank you, Darby. And we'll move on to Mount Pleasant High School with uh, John Winkler and Jeff Platty. Thanks for being here tonight, guys. Thanks for having us. Um, first, we made a big switch to bringing back kids four days a week from two days a week. And we pro I think we gained just over 30 students that moved from Oilers Online to the face-to-face -face model. So you can see our current numbers. We have 738 face-to-face -face and 338 in our Oilers Online model. We go Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, face-to-face, -face, and then have virtual Wednesdays. We still have our Oilers online five days a week virtual. It was a busy and a 
you know, hectic transition sometimes. We had to make a lot of schedule changes. We had to put in a third lunch. We had to make some classroom changes to move them to, you know, better suited classrooms for the size. But overall, like I said, we had a great start. Some of the biggest concerns that we had were both classrooms because of the time spent in there and also lunchtime because of we're removing the mask. And so I just wanted to give you some you know, information about that. In our traditional classrooms, which are the normal size classrooms, not counting the music room, the gym, some smaller special ed rooms, the career tech center, we had an average of 18 students per teacher with our largest being 26. And then in all of our classrooms averaged together with the gym, you know, the music room and so on, it was 17 students per, you know, teacher in there, per classroom. So we've been able to keep, depending on the classroom, four to six feet still in there. Teachers have done a great job in rearranging the desks in their classroom and, you know, different things. Like I said, they've been, they've been amazing in trying to problem solve some areas and move things around and so on. The other area where we had concerns was in the lunchroom just because they're removing the mask. Um, right now our lunches average about 246 students, which in the hybrid model, they were about 180, 185 in that thing. Normally last year, we had about 550 students in it. So, you know, we're sitting about 50% capacity. We were able to bring in some more tables. We've moved some around. Our kids have always kind of eaten out in the hallways. And so it's, it's you know, kids kind of have their own areas now. We got some new furniture out in the, the main lobby area. So that was nice. And so overall, like I said, the lunches have been, you know, been going well. The third lunch makes it hectic because they run one after another. And so GRBS, our, you know, maintenance cleaning area has been just, you know, working extremely hard. And SFE, our food service, has also done a great job in making sure that they can get these kids fed and cleaned and social distance and so on. So it's been a, like I said, an interesting time. Um, in talking about virtual Wednesdays, we have such a diversity of classes from career tech to, you know, music, gym classes, all different kinds of classes. And so our teachers really have used the virtual Wednesdays in a lot of different ways that best fits, you know, with the strategies that work best in their classrooms. And so the first part there, you know, what do we expect from our students? First thing is we need them to understand that Wednesdays are a full day of learning. They should be getting on in the morning, you know, just like normal. And like I said, plan on the rest of the day. How the teacher structures that, like I said, depends on it. But they, they need to understand that it's a full day of learning. Um, every day there's an attendance question for them to answer. They need to attend any of the Google Meets that are happening, whether they be individual or a group. Many teachers are doing help rooms, and so that's a great time to do it. Like I said they have to complete whatever the learning activities are for that day in the class. Um, so there'll be really an attendance part each time to start, and then also a different learning activities that are gonna happen. And then they need to communicate any difficulties that they're having, any problems and any needs to their teacher during those Google Meets or in the help room or in the email chats that they have. And what should students expect from their teachers? First off, that they're going to get an attendance question that they have to answer every day, you know, for us to take attendance. They're going to have individual Google Meets. Teachers sometimes are breaking them out into smaller groups. There's also large group, small group Google Meets that are happening. There's going to be some type of learning activity that happens every day or at least in the net, you know, I mean, sometimes it's finishing up a project, sometimes it's working together, sometimes it's small group stuff. Teachers also have sometimes filmed videos with instructions to different projects. Sometimes they're working on independent practice during that time. Sometimes they're taking online assessments. 
There's also some small group interventions that happen when the teacher sees a need for that. There's virtual help rooms that are going on. And then this is also a time for us to have direct contact with the students and the parents. All right, thank you, John. We'll come back to that when we go for question and answers. Next, we'll move on to our air quality update with Josh Lewis. Thanks for being here, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Um, good evening. There's a couple people on here I haven't spoken in front of, so it's nice to kind of meet you. Um, once we get back to normal, I'll see you face to face. But um, a couple of you guys haven't heard this, so I'm just kind of going to touch on it briefly. Um, CO2 levels is kind of the standard that a lot of people are using right now, ASHRAE and OSHA are recommending to kind of judge air quality given the pandemic. Um, the preferred range for indoor air quality is below a thousand parts per million. Typical outdoor ranges, so fresh air can be anywhere from like 350 to 450, but can be as high as like six to 900 and even higher in higher populated areas. Us around here, we've been averaging about 500 um, when we've been taking our readings. So you can see the numbers I reported in the fall from the schools I tested um, when I first came to you guys. They're pretty good. Um, at that point, I didn't really know what to expect, but I was happy with what I'd seen. Um, and everything in the blue is up, is up to date. So I've taken samples from classrooms and like all the different kinds of wings because we have so many different systems that have been updated across the board, you know, by year and some are old, some are new, just as additions have been put on and so on and so forth. All of our numbers are pretty good. Um, I'm pretty happy with them. The GI Tech's the worst, and that's kind of the oldest or one of the older buildings and one of the ones that hasn't been updated in quite some time. Um, so I do have a couple units on there that I would like to maybe look at replacing eventually. So yeah, overall, I'm pretty happy with our numbers. Um, yeah, so I'm sure you guys, and I think all of you guys have seen the New York Times video that kind of shows COVID particles swirling around a room and everything. It's actually really neat, and I thought I thought it was pretty cool looking. But, um, and everyone, you know, everyone's pretty excited about it. ASHRAE and OSHRAE, everyone agrees that opening windows is definitely awesome. Um, in Michigan, kind of hard to pull off in the in the winter, but that doesn't necessarily change anything. We're still going to push for that. And I'm going to send a reminder out once the weather kind of changes um, and the temps kind of stay a little bit higher to remind and encourage uh, teachers to do that. But a lot of our, that style of room with the unit vents on the exterior wall below the window, we have a lot of them and they heat pretty unevenly. So I already get a lot of complaints that the person, the student that has to sit next to that is either roasting hot or freezing cold. Meanwhile, the person on the other side of the classroom is a lot more comfortable. So if we open a window and put a box fan in like that graphic, I think we might get, I don't know, it might be, might be hard to pull off, but we can try. Um, this video came to light from my understanding from a high school student. This, unfortunately, doesn't really apply to our high school. Our high school was built in the 98 bond. We do not have unit vents like that, like that classroom graphic. We have a much more sophisticated system there. Um, it's air handlers with VAVs and VFDs, so just things that kind of modulate. And it's a lot more similar to, like, your house. So you'll have, if you picture a classroom, you'll have multiple supply ducts coming down, and you'll have the returns in the ceiling as well. So a lot of that hot air that's rising and being expelled is being sucked up to the center of the room. It's not being pulled across, you know, and down low like that graphic shows and kind of, you know, pulling that air flow, you know, across all the different kids. It's a lot better system. Um, those systems also being a lot newer and a lot nicer, strictly only use MERP 13 filters. So I'd love to get everything caught up to that, you know, on that level one day. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's that's a process that could take decades. But um, so I kind of contribute the new the new engineering and the new design, the new the higher rated filters in the high school. I attribute a lot of our success with not spreading there, um, you know, to those new systems. So I'm pretty sure I touched everything on that. So I'm sure you guys will have some questions. But um, 
the latest guidance from the state of Michigan. So they have uh, like safety protocols continued and we are still doing many of those protocols, whether it be disinfecting every four hours or um, increasing fresh air intake. We haven't decreased the fresh air intake since we increased it. Um, I was a little nervous going into those cold stretches because that increase in fresh air in a lot of those tends to equal frozen coils and then flooded classrooms. So we were kind of keeping a very close eye on that and watching temperatures. And luckily, and knock on wood, it hasn't been a crazy winter. So um, I think we were able to just keep as many as we could open um, to encourage more fresh air intake. So the only thing we're not doing in their guidance is putting box fans in windows. Um, that would require a lot of box fans. <laughs> And obviously winter, you can't really put a fan in a window. That's, you know, that's just not going to work. On top of the fact that it, um, I've never met a fire inspector that would be happy to see that, you know, one in each classroom and then you're draping extension cords around to get everything plugged in. So that's kind of the only thing that we aren't doing out of their new update. And I'm not saying I'll, I'm pulling it off the table, but we definitely might have to have some discussions and, um, get, you know, get the fire inspector involved if you guys were wanting to maybe go that direction but on top of buying a lot of fans but um the second thing they brought up is eagle so the environment michigan's department of environment and great lakes and energy they do have a facility survey out there to i filled it all out i haven't heard anything back in a, from a lot of the other facility directors in the larger districts they haven't heard anything back either um i think it's a pretty big undertaking but they're offering some hvac assistance whether that be like a specialized um, contractor of your choice to come in and assess your buildings kind of give them some insight on where we're sitting so like do michigan schools need help with our hvac systems do we need more funding a lot of us are hoping that we filled it out that maybe it'll end up being like more funding down the road to upgrade units or something along those lines but i haven't heard back and as far as like getting a contractor here to come assess our hvac needs or our hvac systems i mean that would honestly probably take months um, we have so many different systems in you know every system is different we've swapped out you know out of a wing we've swapped out you know several already because they've needed replaced over the over the years so that would be a, a huge undertaking in itself but um so i'm still waiting to hear back and you know as i do and if i do i will definitely keep you guys posted but still waiting to hear so i don't know if you guys have any questions all right thanks josh we will get to questions here in just a minute oh okay yep, yep. Just wanted to wrap up just a little bit. We are operating now under new epidemic orders from MDHHS. Um, those guidelines went into effect on March 2nd, or I'm sorry, the guidelines came out on March 2nd. They went into effect on March 5th, and right now they stem through April 19th. Um, they do maintain the recommendation that all schools offer face-to-face -face instruction by March 1st. They also provided new travel guidance, which, which we have shared with our staff. And they continue to look at the three key metrics, which is the hospital capacity, overall cases, and positivity rate in our community. We've got some work ahead of us as we continue uh, now moving into third trimester. Once the dust settles from starting third trimester, we know that we need to look in two areas. One is focusing on year-end activities, and then the second is planning for next year. Um, as far as our year-end activities go, anything that we think about planning or doing safety again has to be our top priority so as lauren mentioned early on we're looking at things like obviously graduation our senior farewell tour some of those year-end activities that we traditionally hold and want to be able to host for our students we want to make sure that we're able to do that um, as i mentioned earlier we're looking forward to being able to offer that pop-up testing after spring break um, and then we have a, a great plan in the works for spring extracurricular activities. The fine arts department um, from the high school and middle school have great ideas for concerts that will be able to include um, performances from all of our groups and include community members in a safe way. And um, I believe our athletic department is ready to get outside and be able to practice as soon as possible. So there are some great things um, coming on the horizon which we're very grateful for. 
And I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and turn it back over to any board member that has a question for anyone um, that's presented this evening. I have a question for Josh, if you don't mind, Josh. Um, you presented averages for each school, and I was curious if you had a little bit more information on how much noise is there around these averages. Do you find that most classrooms do fit pretty neatly around there, or is there some outliers that are quite a bit higher in each, in each of these schools, if that makes sense? Yeah, uh, totally makes sense. So I haven't had many outliers since the first one in the middle school. The middle school, we had one room that was above a thousand, just slightly above a thousand, only by a couple digits. But um, everything else has been pretty, pretty much, you know, pretty equal. Um, the Botech, like I said, that whole area, the averages were similar, but they all ran a little higher than I would like to see in this, you know, in the 700s. So that building being built in the early 60s and a lot of it hasn't got a lot of updates when it comes to the hvac systems i'd like to tackle some of those um to kind of increase those but a lot of those areas the main areas like the kitchen and nursing a lot of those have been updated but it's like this the perimeter classes that still have systems similar to that graphic that you've seen that are kind of the heart you know that we're not getting numbers that i would love but um everything's been pretty similar so I don't really have any complaints there. So. Well, that's really good to hear. And so it seems like from what you showed us, you don't have any classrooms besides that one from the middle school that was above 800. Because that's the recommendation that they have is to keep it below 800. So if we can do that, that's fantastic. Yeah. And then yep. for the few that are above, if we have the means to um, target these classrooms specifically to keep the kids safe and the ones that are higher, it seems to be like what we'd want to do. Yep, 100%. Yep, awesome. Thank you. Yep. And just to be clear, I did not check every classroom. Um, it's kind of, it's pretty disruptive when I'm in there for five minutes holding the, holding the meter. Um, so, I, yeah, we just check like a few from each type of wing that have similar systems. So, just to repeat myself. No, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Josh, I'd just like to make a comment. Thank you for doing that work because uh, we have illness in our schools forever. We've had illnesses in the winter. And so this work was done in the winter. So I think it adds to us keeping a healthier environment um, because we've always had influenza A, influenza B, colds. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I think um, looking at this and monitoring this helps not just for COVID, but all of the other things that we're seeing great decreases in. Um, uh, and, and it makes it easier for the staff because they're not getting sick and not passing it to kids and all that stuff. So I think all that is contributing to a healthier school environment. So thank you for doing that work. You're welcome. Um, and a little, I mean, a little off topic back to the beginning of the year. Thankfully for Jen and Ginger letting me buy a Clorox 360, one of those electrostatic disinfectant machines for each building. I'm hoping that once COVID's come and gone, that I'm hoping with those that we'll be able to keep our flu numbers down significantly compared to what we, you know, what we were able to do in the past. So hoping that gets better. Also, Darby, I wanted to thank you and your team. Um, I understand Wednesday is much better now. Um, thank you. It, it's kind of confusing, but you have a lot of moving pieces in your building um, and it's very complex. And so um, as a board member, um, your presentation by your team helped a lot. Me a better understand how those pieces are fitting together. So thank you for doing that work. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. I do have a question, I think both for you know you Darby and, and uh, for our high school as well. If you have any information, and I'm more curious than anything else, about attendance on virtual Wednesdays. If teachers are you know actually like they are offering, I understand, but whether we see um, high attendance on these days, if the students are actually accomplishing the work, attending these meetings, uh, or if we do see decreased attendance from what we'd expect. I can speak a little bit at the high school. So in our previous hybrid model in, on Wednesdays, it really varied from class to class. If it was an AP class, we saw great attendance. If it was a 
you know, general ed class, like an English nine or something, it dropped a little bit on those days, you know, and so some, some were, you know, great attendance, some were not as great. We've only had one Wednesday so far in, since we've brought the kids back, you know, four days a week, but the Wednesday was better. And so that's, I'll, we'll have to update you on that one. Thank you, John. We, we can get you specific numbers as well. Um, I think that you would probably be surprised at the number of students, even on a normal um, day, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday, that don't attend the online sessions as well. Um, you know, we, our teachers work hard to offer some of those live options, but a lot of the time, maybe only two or three Euler Online students might attend it, attend that session. So, um, it's that's for the online students, right? And so, but on the Wednesday, that would be opened up to everyone, um, right? So, I think I think across the board, the numbers would be um, interesting for all of them. So, we right. could put something like that together. I don't want to give you too much more work. So, if it's not too hard, I'd love to see them. If it's a pain, I get it. Um, but it's nice that the online students and the face-to-face -face have a chance potentially to interact on the Wednesday is a, a really nice opportunity there. I think that's the, the biggest pro for it. I have more questions, but I, I don't want to dominate. So if my fellow board members want to go ahead, I can, I can be quiet for a bit. Really, why don't you go ahead and, and ask your questions that you have? All right. I can definitely do that. My uh, other question was with the high school. I It seemed like um, the numbers, the average number per classroom was actually lower than I expected. And that might be due to the fact that we didn't have a huge switch from virtual to face-to-face. -to -face. And I, I saw there was a, a lot of variation. Obviously you have an average of 16, 17, I think up to 18, but then some are bigger to 26. My main question was what's happening in the hallways? And so we really increased our cohort size and that means a lot more moving bodies. And I was wondering if the hallway was one of the you know, areas where we might see you know, more transmission, it does seem like um, they're not in the hallway for very long. So I'm not sure that's, we really need to worry about this, but I just was wondering if you could talk about this a little bit. We definitely saw an influx of kids. I mean, it's, it's a thing, but with the shortened time before school starts, the short, you know, having them leave right after and reducing the passing time between classes to five minutes, Kids have just pretty much been trained to go right from there, right back, you know, from one class to the other. And so there's definitely more kids, but they're in the hallway short, you know, for a shortened period of time. And, you know, we're still struggling with noses peeking out from time to time. And so we're working on that right now. But like I said, it's, it's uh, you know, the, most kids are in the hallway for three or four minutes max because they have to be most, you know, and so that's, but there, we've, we've definitely seen more kids, so. And one thing that I would add too, is that remember our building is built to hold 1200 or a little bit more than 1200 students. So it certainly feels more crowded now than it did in the previous trimesters, but to have 700 some students in the building for, in a building built for 1200 does not feel crowded and and then like mr winkler pointed out you know the kids are getting to where they need to be quickly and stuff so there's no loitering in the hallways and it doesn't feel yeah it doesn't feel negative or unsafe in any way well, thank you uh, thank you for your answers i appreciate it
I can keep going. I have one more, and that's a very general question. And I know, Jennifer, and it's mostly for you or for, I guess, all of us. The most common question I'm getting right now as a board member is what about next year? And I understand that there's so much unknown that some of it we have to wait for the state to tell us. Uh, the question I get for next year is whether there'll be an online order, is whether parents have to worry about finding some kind of other solution if they are not comfortable taking that chance, uh, regardless of where the risk might be. Can we tell the community anything at that point? I mean, I've been saying right now we have to wait, uh, but I wondered if we can maybe start planning um, or at least address this a little bit tonight? Sure, definitely. So when, when you say start planning, the, the great irony is, is that we started planning for next year, uh, probably back in January. So as much as we focus so much here on what's happening this year, um, in fact, we, we held our very first kindergarten kickoff this evening at Ganyard. So we're ready and, and we're full in planning for next fall. Um, our hope actually is that we will be able to bring to you as board members um, a calendar uh, for the 21-22 school year at our very next board meeting. So we're hoping you know, that we'll be able to move forward with that process pretty quickly. Um, the, the short answer, well, to your question, of course, is my favorite one right now is it all depends, right? Um, so I, I think that if we have a need in our community to continue to offer a virtual program, and that's something that the state of Michigan still allows us to do, then, then yes, I believe that we'll be able to offer a virtual program. I don't know tonight what that looks like. I don't know if it'll be set up the same way this year's program has been. Certainly we've learned a lot from this year, um, but I think what we need to be able to do is we need to um, go, in, go back and survey our parents, find out what folks want to be able to do knowing that a lot can change between now and August um, and be able to move forward. So last year we knew that there was no question that we had to be able to offer both for our families. And if we continue to feel that need, then we'll have to continue to accommodate that somehow. So right now we are planning for, I'm gonna say a quote unquote, regular school year, right? We're planning for an eight period day at the middle school. We're planning for a full time at our elementary buildings. We're planning for full time at the high school. And then we'll have a basis from which to make adjustments to if we need to, right? So if we're still living in a world where it's a pandemic and we, we don't feel as though uh, we've reached herd immunity, um, then what do we need to do to make our students and our staff safe in school? And that will be the planning that we'll have to do over the next few months. But my hope would be that we've learned enough from this year that we'll be able to be flexible and meet the needs of our community if, if that exists. So um, I, don't, I don't want community members to think that because we're not talking about it, it means we're not planning for it. Um, but I, I do think timing is everything where we really needed to get through um, the start of the third trimester and then be able to move forward. The other big topic that we're talking a lot about um, right now is what does summer programming look like for our students? Um, certainly the state of Michigan has put a big emphasis on summer options. And we know that that will look different at different grade levels for us, or maybe some programming might be focused on skill building. Maybe the high school programming is focused on credit recovery, um, but we need to finalize those plans as well and get that out to our community so that everyone knows uh, you know, what's happening. So I would just say probably within the next month, we'll know a lot more about both summer programs and next fall and be able to share more information with our families then. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate your honesty. And I think that's, you know, what we need to hear as a community. Um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we want? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask if we wanted to move into public comment or if there are board members that had additional questions or. I think we should move into to public comment. Okay, so we will go ahead and ask um, members of the community that are with us this evening to raise your virtual hand. I will unmute your microphone and we'll invite you to speak. So Daylin, are you there? Yeah, I am. Can you hear me? We can, yes, go ahead. 
Hi there, I'm Dale Mulnozanata. I'm a mother of a Fancher student. And um, I'd just like to make a comment about this. I've been um, watching throughout this whole year during this massive pivot, which I think that the Mount Pleasant Public Schools have done an amazing job um, keeping our students healthy, um, the majority of them. I do think when we're looking at the reporting, and each time I've seen this, it says all students are wearing masks all the time. Um, we need to be a little bit more honest with the reporting, I think, and we have to say that they're wearing them all the time, um, with the exception, as we've mentioned, with the cafeteria and eating, but also outside in the outside. Um, I do think we've done a tremendous job uh, in especially the K to fives um, with the cohorts, but I'm not um, thinking at all that these kids are not super close to one another when they're outside since the very beginning, even when we were peaking and had to pull our students out of school and still somehow um, not getting really high numbers of COVID. Um, I do think after all of this is said and done, there will be lots of reporting on things that are happening throughout the state and the country and looking at precisely how those data were used, um, making sure that we say that we, we were allowing them to not wear masks outside um, during those recess times and those fresh air times is really important. Um, with that, that's all I really have to say. So thank you. Thank you. Bree, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Hello, well, good evening to all of you. Uh, the first thing that I would love to say, uh, I think it's great that you're bringing all of this up again uh, with the plan for the trimester that we're already into. I know that from, from knowing teachers, um, from speaking with teachers, teachers have put in so much effort and I want to make sure that it's very clear the teachers are so completely appreciative. You know, as I listened to all of this and uh, just the lady that had that had commented before me, um, reminding about the masking and wearing the masking. And all of us are well aware at this point in time that COVID is not as problematic in the schools as we initially had thought that it would be. And there's no arguing that. Everybody knows that the governor has stated it. Schools should definitely be open full-time face-to-face. So speaking specifically, I have a high schooler. She's not interested in this point at going back for the trimester the way it is. I'm not sure if you've all spoken actually to kids individually to see how engaged they are and how inspired they are with school uh, because I do know that's our vision statement. Kids are not engaged and they're not inspired and they are surely not feeling empowered with excellence at this point. It's obviously far into the game, but looking specifically at our middle school, I hear all of this talk that's done and it seems like so much time has been put into all of the reasons we're not going to open fully for them and keeping them at a half day. I just listened to how it was presented that, you know, there are four days a week and there's still five hours out of seven hours a day, but I just wanna do some like basic math and break that down. So if we have 35 hours of instruction a week on a normal school year, that's seven hours a day, five days a week. If we're attending school, four days a week, and there are five hours that are in person, that's 20 hours of face-to-face. -face. And I think that's the minimum that we're now required. I'm not sure on that, so don't quote me. But if we take those additional two hours on those four days and those full seven hours that we're not getting on Wednesday, that's 15 hours of online instruction. And to think that this is happening in our middle school still, and this is the best that we could do as a district, is to only offer our middle schoolers 15 out of 35 hours where they still have to do that online. So going back to even the roots of a middle schooler and everybody knows all the way down to the not deodorant stage, we have to now wear deodorant. That is such an impressionable and such a huge growing moment for middle schoolers just in their age. And then to know that they're the one group that's been left out of this entire plan. And I still just find that to be completely unacceptable. And you know, furthermore, Jennifer, you, you know that you and I have communicated on this. I think that that's the best version rather than emailing every single school board member. But I hear all of the positives that come from parents. And what I don't hear is what you're getting and obtaining from parents that's actual and factual because nowhere have I heard parent feedback or even got a parent survey or a response about a parent survey 
but what I have got is how the staff wants to do things, the students, and the good feedback. And at this point in the game, there's obviously nothing that's going to be done, but the communication that is lacking between the parents and the school board, I just find it to be phenomenally awful. And then to kind of cap it all back here, because I know I'm on a time limit, going all the way back to our middle school not being able to go a full day because of lunch. And I know you're working so hard to keep that six foot distance, but I want to remind you all, there's a giant difference between a recommendation and a requirement. And there is no award that anybody's going to get to say that our kids were distanced for six feet all day long. I assure you, like you can be fully commended for making that happen, but let's think where we should be commended. And that's engaging and inspiring our kids. It's time that as a district, we start empowering these children with excellence. And I understand it's going to mean people have to work more, but newsflash through COVID, I've been a business that stayed open and I've had to work a lot more. Everybody does. And those that really care about the students, they're going to do it and they're going to do it with a happy heart. So again, I just want to make sure that teachers know you are 100% appreciated. I cannot imagine having your job. Um, I wish that more so people would put themselves in the position of the children. Thank you, Bree. Thank you. And at this point, I don't see that any other community member does have their hand raised. So I'll give you all a moment. If anyone would like to say anything, please raise your virtual hand. Okay, at this time, we're moving on to any citizen who would like to address the board for anything other than a COVID-related item. So again, different verse, same as the first. If anyone uh, would like to make any comment to the board, please raise your virtual hand and I will unmute your microphone so you are able to do so. I don't see any hands at this time, Amy. Okay, thank you. Um, now it's time for the Board of Education discussion. If there's any board member who has anything that they would like to talk about, now's the time to do so. I would just like to um, thank all of our administrators and all the teachers and everybody else. Um, this is a big load on all of you. So thank you all for giving us all the information you can and more than what is necessary. Um, we really appreciate you. I agree. It's really nice to see your presentations and have all the information laid out like this, both for us and for the community. Uh, and I think as the year goes, I'm hoping that for everyone, that picture of what really is happening in our schools gets clearer and clearer, even if we might not be in those buildings. And so thank you for all that you do. I do have, um, so I sit on the um, Mount Pleasant Education Foundation Committee and they asked me that I report back. Um, and so this seems like a good time maybe to do that uh, to the rest of the board. I can keep it really brief, Amy. Um, that was, I have attended just one of their meetings. For those of you that might not know, and that was my case before I joined the board. Uh, the foundation is, I believe about eight years old. Um, and, and Jennifer, feel free to interrupt me and correct me if I'm incorrect <laughs> anytime. Uh, it's a foundation that's put uh, specifically to raise funds for classroom equipment. Um, they right now offer uh, for any teachers in our district, they can apply for up to $1,000 of equipment that they might not be able to acquire any other ways. To give you an idea of their effort, I pulled um, some of what they sent me. Uh, they have managed to get two individual teachers uh, right 
under $50,000 over the last seven years, which for a small organization that's really young, is quite, uh, quite a, a, you know, a large um, undertaking. And um, together with some of the larger grants they've obtained, um, a total of just over $200,000 was raised. Uh, and so they wanted me to share with you um, a little bit about their, what they're doing. If you're interested, they have a website. You can get to it through our school district web website on that main page, and it tells you a little bit about the mission uh, and what they've been doing. And then last but not least, what I thought was really impressive, and some of you knew this because they actually got into the morning sun, they raised, uh, I believe, just around $20,000 uh, this year, just this fall, for calculators uh, for our high school students. And so that was that was quite quite a, an achievement. Um, and so that's it. I just wanted to let you know, and I'll keep reporting when uh, I learn more. Thanks, Lily. And I too wanted to say thank you to all of our um, panelists tonight who were able to present um, and just kind of share what's going on in the schools. I think that it's important that we keep continuing to hear um, all that's going on, the, the good and the bad. Um, and I think it's important that the community hears that as, as well. So I appreciate for all the work and the late nights and the, the after hours, because um, I don't think those are always recognized. But, but you know, as you can see in the background, most of you are still sitting at the school building at eight o'clock at night. So thank you very much for doing so. Is there any other board member who has anything else they would like to talk about? Okay, not seeing any, then we will go ahead and call this meeting adjourned. Thank you, and I hope everybody has a wonderful night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye.